Okay, so everybody can hear me. Um, uh, it is very nice for me to be invited today. Um, I'm Andre Forslu from South Africa. I'm the, in, in Cape Town. Now, of course, at yesterday's uh, conference in Johannesburg, you all heard retired Justice Yakia Cook, a very well known blind person, who spoke about this very same issue and about how it affects this age. <coughs> So I'm not going to make half an hour speech unless you want to listen to me for half an hour because it's a very passionate thing. Uh, we in the disability sector have been acting this for seven, eight years now. Since the Marrakesh Treaty was formed in Marrakesh, Morocco, the United States is speaking about this very same thing. But just for your information, <clears throat> what the copyright law is currently is that we from the sector from the visually impaired sector we we're getting access to about 0.5 percent of works published in south africa 0.5 guys this is we currently have i have a situation personally where a blind employee has been offered to go on a course for promotion by an employer however the publishers of the manual refuse to give us copyright there's a print manual in front of her we cannot create it to any other accessible format for us so that it is able to, to, to do a course. And this is the reality in South Africa. And it's, it's worldwide with, um, with our disabled community. There's a huge book family. Very interesting that South Africa was uh, in the lead when the United Nations Medicaid Treaty uh, was formulated at the time. Many of our poorer neighbors, like Zimbabwe and other countries, have already ratified it. We are still sitting with the book family. And we are hoping that the copyright amendment will, we were actually hoping it would be signed before the election because we realized that after the election, uh, President Ramaphosa is so busy now, has probably fallen into a black hole somewhere. But let us keep pushing and let us end this book famine for the print disabled people in this country. Thank you very much. Firstly, I just want to acknowledge some of the work that Ruth has done. Um, I was privileged to attend the Marrakesh United Conference in 2013. Um, and we were in a position where we could listen to the negotiations. Um, I think Ruth, I mean, it's not the negotiations aren't public, so most people don't know this, but Ruth played a critical part in getting that treatment. So my question is roughly on the same topic as a pretense um, for achieving this goal. Is there, would it make sense to advocate for a treaty for education exception, or is it more productive to just advocate at a national level? So I'd like both short and is uh, the concept of decolonization of um, intellectual property is so right and I think it's so needful. However, I'm looking at the practicality. I do not know if um, Professor Ruth has talked about the practicality of decolonization of intellectual property, right? especially where it has to do with looking at the digital world and the internet of things. 
how, how uh, where, where you have different rises, different readers from different jurisdictions, different laws apply. When we want to do this, when we want to apply this decolonization into African laws, how practicable can it be? How do we go about it? You stole the mic. <laughs> Let Simon speak and then come to Douglas at the front. Sorry about that. My name is Simon. I'm a doctor at the law faculty. And uh, I have a, I think a comment, I have a question particularly, a request. Uh, maybe it's perhaps the nature, the theme of the, of the presentation about the colonization. But I was, I was hoping one of the two presenters would uh, at least play uh, devil's advocate and critique fair use because I feel it has sort of been one-sided and, and fair use much as it's, yeah, it gets to help with the decolonization and decolonization of the IP uh, ecosystem, I feel it still has its strong critics that maybe should be fleshed out. Thank you, Simon. Grace, I'll see you. Second round. Douglas is a good Yeah. Thank you. Um, gosh, I, I got a, I got a lot of questions, but um, I'm only going to stick to one, and I'll maybe save the other ones for later. <laughs> so um, I'm from Wikimedia South Africa. Uh, we represent Wikipedia editors in this country, or our members. Uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit from my usual sort of questions and interests in the Wikipedia world um, and go to a more economics-based one. So we hear a lot these days, um, especially from people who are against the bill, who are against fair use, open copyright, about how um, fair use, uh, uh, reduced copyrights, rules, um, uh, weakening will will weaken copyright and will have a negative impact on you know the, the economy and they paint this very bleak picture of you know doom and gloom and how strong copyrights are our only path to salvation. I personally disagree with them, <laughs> and you you clearly you clearly do as well as was touched a bit in, in your presentation. Um, I want to know if you could unpack a little bit more for us um, the the. The impact, um, the positive impacts of uh, open copyright uh, regime in a developing country like South Africa, um, especially with regards to uh, technology development. Uh, and like I said, I, I know you touched on it briefly. I just want to unpack that a little bit further, such as say in the YouTube economy or in the software development economy, um, as well as in other areas uh, of music industry. Is another good one. So thank you. Thank you. So let's allow the speakers, I think, an opportunity to engage in those questions later on. Okay. Um, Most of those were, were kind of comments that you know, one, one can apply to. Marcus had a specific question about the uh, strategic use of trees. Um, and I'd specifically like to invite you to the meeting we're having right after this, Marcus, so we can talk about that very, very strategically. Um, and, and, it, and it feeds into the question from Representative from Wine South Africa. But so there's been a treaty um, called the Marrakesh Treaty that requires countries to adopt. Um, requires countries that, sign, that have signed it, which South Africa has not yet, it has not ratified the treaty, but requires its members to have exceptions to promote accessible material to people with disabilities. Um, South Africa's plan is to ratify that treaty, but they want to pass the legislation first. So in order for them to join the treaty, 
it's a political choice, it's not required by the treaty itself, um, but they need to pass this legislation because of the choice they've made in order to ratify the treaty. And then once they do, then that facilitates, in addition to requiring this exception, it facilitates the other provision, which is the cross-border access rights, which allows trade and access to material between countries. And the, you know, the, the big opportunity there is that the United States, under the Trump administration, has actually ratified that treaty before some of it. Um, and because of the Google Books project, we've digitized millions of books and our courts have held that it is a fair use to provide those copies for people with disabilities to be able to read them and which means that once South Africa joins and once other countries join there's the possibility of gaining access to um, I mean it, it's all the volumes of Harvard and all the major universities copied all of their books and so there's, there's the ability that we could go from this point five to you know thousands of percent. I mean, you based your percentage on the amount of books that were published in South Africa. Why would we want to restrict people to reading only books that are published in South Africa? Um, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Just because it's a copyright law, it's restricted. We'd yeah. love to. Um, in the United States, I've got a site called Bookshare. Um, yeah. There is something like already 600,000 titles in accessible format on there. That's just that side. Can you imagine if, if we could get this? Sorry, I interrupted you, Professor. I, uh, if we if we can can get all this done tomorrow, then I can access or blind people, disabled people in this country can access 600,000 titles already. There'd be a huge difference. Uh, our, our percentage is actually based on local publications. <coughs> Um, the current publication laws do not uh, permit us to ch exchange with overseas countries. That's another one of our problems. So, so, so this is an incredible area to watch, you know, and I think it's I think it's going in the right direction. And, and the, um, the, the disability community is an important advocate for this. Um, but the, you know, the question was the strategic issue. I mean, I think I think Marrakech is showing that it can be useful to start with a treaty, and that pushes a lot of countries forward. And so I think that can be one strategy. Um, the other strategy, of course, is don't wait for the treaty, and that's what South Africa is doing on the education side. I am involved in um, with some uh, educators, so Education International, which is a group of 30 million teachers unions, and South Africa's teachers union specifically have signed on to um, a campaign to push WIPO to adopt an education treaty. But I'll tell you, it's a long way. Um, the publishers, this is what they really don't want. You know, they kind of said, well, we'll accept this kind of disability rights treaty. It's a small market. We're not serving it. We don't see it as a problem. But the education market's a real market. You know, I put those numbers up. And it's a market they're exploiting all over the world. And it's a market they don't want to <coughs> give at all. But you know, the other fact that I didn't put up, which all of you know that are students, is that 70% of students get all of their all of their learning materials through copies. <coughs> right? Shadow libraries. Sharing. Illegally. <laughs> <laughs> But some of those activities would not be illegal under the new copyright. It wouldn't be illegal to have the textbook on a digital file if it was excessively priced and that's the way you needed to access it. And that's, so that, you know, this is the radical move. You know, you can get more radical, but that's the only clause like that I know of with any copyright law in the world. And I would encourage you to advocate for it. The, the students in the room that are involved in the falls movement we need you. You know, you're, this law needs you. This is why it's it's locked up because the publishers are fighting. Very. Well. If you read the newspapers, you only need to. So this is a this is a real debate.
Well, one of the reasons that I um, think it's so important that this conversation is happening um, is because, in my view, part of decolonization is creating institutions locally that can respond to local needs. The copyright system across most African countries is clearly utilized by anyone other than um, foreign owners. I mean, I've been doing uh, work now on IP for many, many years, and, and when a government calls me and says, you know, give us your thoughts, we've just gotten um, a suggestion from X or Y, I can always tell that it was not developed by local lawyers and has no relevance to local institutions or local needs. And so if you were to pick up the South African Copyright Bill today, your act today, I don't think you would see yourself in it. Um, because many of these bills are designed not for productivity locally, but for defending um, interests. And I don't think that's bad. I don't think defending um, you know, multinationals and, and uh, foreign investors is a bad thing at all. But I think when that's the only thing that your laws facilitate, then it's a danger to future generations. It questions your own participation in the production of culture in your own country. And I think that's a danger. For me, <coughs> simply saying decolonization um, doesn't mean anything if at the end of the day, individual citizens and local institutions and entrepreneurs are not enabled to access and produce cultural goods and to consume them. So what's, what does that mean practically? It means practically that um, courts and government agencies and universities are going to be the major players in a reoriented South African economy. Libraries are pivotal. No matter what kind of copyright law you have, not everyone will be able to access books and cultural goods. You still need the support of intermediaries. And so libraries are going to be vital. Libraries are going to be critical for education, for access to knowledge. And one of the things, in my view, that is really important is making sure that libraries are protected in their capacity to make archival copies, in their capacity to do electronic lending, in their capacity to do cross-border lending, right? That's really vital. And had South Africa had a law that even copied Great Britain in its entirety, South Africa and most African countries would be in a better position today. The problem with colonization was not, at least in the area of copyright, was not that the law itself was left in Africa. It's that the law that was left was not the law that was being operated in the colonial administration. And so what you had was essentially legal frameworks that were already oriented externally, and they remained external in their orientation. So for example, we now have the Marrakesh Treaty. Why is it that visually impaired persons in South Africa still have no access to accessible format copies? Well, I'll tell you something that's interesting. In the US and in most industrialized countries, there is an exception for blind people and for visually impaired people. <coughs> so most industrialized countries, frankly, did not need an international treaty other than to make cross-border lending and sharing possible. So it's striking to me that the South African copyright law today has no exception for visually impaired persons has no fair use doctrine under which other countries gave access to visually impaired persons and has not ratified Marrakesh. So the international regime has not been adopted and local exceptions have not been established. So the question is, 
what's decolonization if South African visually impaired persons do not have access to the wealth of material that they could have access to? This is not because there are no accessible format copies. This is because you have a law that doesn't enable visually impaired persons or libraries in South Africa to facilitate access to those things. That's a problem. That's a huge problem to me. Because in my view, if you were to decide to copy the laws of England or you know Germany or Switzerland or the US, that would be wonderful. Because those laws, whether they call it fair use, whether they call it a designated exception, whether they call it anti-competition law, those laws make sure that citizens have access to what they need. The challenge in Africa and the challenge for South Africa particularly is that you have a legal regime that is not internally focused and does not facilitate access to knowledge in a global economy where access to knowledge is what makes you possibly able to be productive. That's the challenge. So for me, I don't, you know, you can call it anything you want to call it. The question is, what's the effect? And the Marrakesh example, I think, is just heartbreaking to me. All of the years and all of the amazing passion that South Africa brought to that negotiating table, and for me to be hearing today that four million visually impaired persons in South Africa, including children, are still not able to have access. Now, I differ with lots of commentators in this one regard. One of the reasons I like open-ended flexibilities is because it empowers courts to make the decision about what is the just outcome. That's critical. You know, fair use was not a legislated doctrine in the US until the 1976 Copyright Act. It was, the, it was the judges that created it. The judges looked at this case and said, someone has created, and those of you who are law students will appreciate this, someone had created essentially an annotated legal treatise, right? It was a legal textbook, a legal book, from someone else's, and got sued for copyright infringement. And the judge said, this book is doing something different. It's adding value. For me to rule that this is an infringement, I'm going to ask these kinds of questions. And this is the power of the common law. <laughs> that a judge can look at equity. Where are all my law students? Equity. <laughs> they can look at tort law. They can look at contracts. And they can say this outcome is what is just. And so one of the reasons a flexible system makes sense to me is that it empowers judges to look at local conditions. All right, I'm not going to ask you all to raise your hand, but I would be willing to bet that everyone in this room has photocopied or scanned something that was copyrighted in their lifetime. <laughs> all right, so let's just say we're all infringers. Everyone, everyone in this room is an infringer. <clears throat> now the question of whether or not that's an actionable infringement should be a question that the court looks at. Did you copy the whole book? Did you turn it into an accessible format copy? Did you just take a page or two because you wanted to send it to your friend who forgot her casebook at home when she traveled? Or is it a library that made, it, that made an archival copy? The capacity to draw distinctions between what is right copying and what is wrong copying is something a court should be empowered to do. And then what happens when technology allows me to just sort of look at you and transmit a copy to your brain? How do we deal with that? And so the problem with making everything statutory is that you weaken the power of the courts, you weaken local institutions, and you never get the opportunity to look at the South African context and to say, is this the kind of engagement with a copyrighted work that we think is good in South Africa? That's really important. And then the last question about um, Technologies. One of the things when I was looking at the draft bill, and I wasn't involved with this bill, I wasn't, I, you know, I, I began preparing for this lecture, and that's the first time that I really began looking at the bill. So I don't really know 
what the history is. And frankly, call it fair use, call it developmental use, call it whatever you want to call it. Um, in some countries that have adopted the fair use open-ended standard, as long as they didn't call it fair use, um, entrenched interests were okay with it. Right. It doesn't matter to me what the name is, but I think the idea is how do you allow follow-on innovation? Because fundamentally, a copyright law that does not have appropriate limitations and exceptions is anti-competitive. I am, um, those of you who uh, love music, if you love rap or if you love all kinds of different genres of music, you will know that music builds on music. There is not a single song, not a single piece of music that does not bless you in corporation. <laughs> something, some musical tone or beat. How is that possible? It's possible because fair use, and, and as I say to people all the time, everyone in this room is doing fair use, including you, my dear student. Everyone in South Africa is doing fair use and just not calling it fair use. And the real challenge is you now have, in many countries, a group of people who are described as infringers even though what they're doing is in fact creating a social utility for the country. And somebody's gotta be able to draw that line. So how are you going to give access to follow-up innovators? Everyone has to pay a price for that. I had a very interesting situation happen to me um, recently. I had assigned an article of mine to my students and I wanted my students to comment on it and to critique it. And I went to go um, make copies for the students uh, to ask for the publisher to send me copies. And the publisher said, well, we're not gonna send you copies, you have to buy them. I said, well, you know what, fine. I'm just gonna make copies because I'm not copying the whole article, I just want this section. And the publisher said, we charge $200 a page. <laughs> I said, excuse me? <laughs> my article for my students? I don't think so. And so what did I do as a good copyright? lawyer and professor, the libraries have an exception. I went to the library and I said, I want you to make me 10 copies, put it on the reserve shelf so my students can come read it. And then of course, each of my students under the US Fair Use Doctrine has a right for private copy. So each of my students went to the library, don't record this. So they need to keep, we're gonna edit that up part out. <laughs> for themselves. That's simple. Because I was not going to have my students who already struggle with buying textbooks, who already struggle with law school debt, go pay $200 per page for a five-page segment of an article that I wrote? Uh-huh. It wasn't happening. <laughs> now, the fact that we even have to do all of that is shameful. But I would rather that we are able to do it than for me to say to my students, I'm sorry, you can't read this article. I'm sorry, you can't have access to this. And so I cannot imagine what South African professors are doing. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what South African professors are doing to get you the material that you need at the time that you need it. It, 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 it saddens my heart. So for me, one of the key things about a flexible doctrine is its capacity to promote competition and access. That's the key thing. And, and let me just say here for the young students that are in this room, that a vital thing is we don't know where the technological frontier is going. We just don't know. How many of you would have imagined, even for those of you who are Generation X, how many of you would have imagined that at the touch of a button from your phone, you could forward an entire article to a friend and say this is what the teacher assigned for us to read for Monday. And yet, if you are caught doing that, you would be guilty of infringement. Mm -hmm. So everyday uses of technology has now created a crisis for copyright law in South Africa. That's the problem. And I bet you if I was speaking to your president or to your parliament and I said to them, how many of you forwarded somebody's email? They would all say yes, and I'd say, well, you all should, you know, sue yourshelves or something. <laughs> right. 
And so, as I said to uh, the audience yesterday in a response to a question, the lack of a fair use of flexible, open-ended limitation is inherently a preservation of the status quo, and it is also anti-competitive, especially for new follow-on mm -hmm. innovators in the new uh, digital economy. I think that answered all the questions mm -hmm. that I answered. Now, let me also say, somebody asked about a, a critical approach. There's, I think that there's so much in this bill, which is why I put the slide up. Everything's about, the last, I got to South Africa 20 hours ago, and everything's about fair use. I'm like, oh my god, like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. and there's so many other pieces. Fair use works when you actually have a bill that's designed to promote domestic innovation, domestic creativity, domestic access, domestic development. That's the only time it works. Number two, it does not work perfectly. Fair use can be costly. But most cases, and this is a tragedy to me, the reason many fair use cases don't go to court is because everyone agrees that when you forward the reading that the teacher gave you to your classmate who was out of town and needs to be ready for class on Monday, everybody kind of goes, yeah, that makes sense, that's fair. Like, that's just what we're supposed to do. When you sing in the shower, and 10 million people think you have a wonderful voice and gather outside of your apartment and listen to you, people don't think you should be sued for that, but that would be a violation of the right of, 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 of public performance. Right? When my goddaughter's mother emails me an article she wants me to read, and I print it out, that would be a copyright violation. When I read something from her and I'm going, eh, I don't really like that, and I modify it, I've made a derivative work. That's a copyright violation. Every moment you do that in this digital economy, you are violating somebody's copyright every moment you do something with your little phone that involves you know, reproducing or, 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 or disseminating. So at what point are you going to stop jailing people in South Africa? And who are the people most likely to engage in that sort of conduct, in addition to normal, everyday lives of citizens, it's poor people. It's poor people. And by that I mean students as well. It's people who don't have options for how they're going to get it. What are we going to say to the millions of African children and parents who can't afford educational materials? We're going to say, don't go to school. That's the option. We're going to tell blind people don't read. And that's effectively what we have done. And who's going to educate that generation of South Africans? That's a problem. So I, I think it's it's not fair use is perfect. It's that it's another tool that helps push a society further along the development path, further along the path of competition, further along the path of technological development. And it also means that for the first time, it allows local institutions to look at the South African context and say it makes sense. India, two years ago, um, the Indian High Court, uh, one of the high courts issued a ruling. Publishers sued um, Delhi School of Management, I think it was, because the Delhi School of Management has a photocopying shop on campus that makes photocopies for students. And they went all the way to court. And the Indian court said the right to education is in the Constitution. They didn't even go to the copyright bill. They did, in the US, you wouldn't have had a constitutional provision. You would have had to do fair use. But in India, India just said, you know what? The right to education is a constitutional right. This photocopy shop is making copies, course packs for students. The university has made a submission that this is the only way many of its students can afford to have access to these business school materials. We're going to say it's OK. They didn't call it fair use. They just said it's a constitutional right. In Kenya, the high court, when the Kenyan parliament was trying to pass a bill banning generic drugs, which was being pushed by multinationals in response to the Doha Declaration that South Africa was at the forefront of, the Kenyan high court said the right to health is a constitutional right. And therefore, this bill is unconstitutional because it would limit access to essential and what is interesting to me is that in South Africa, that has not been tested, even though South Africa's constitution has these explicit, explicit socioeconomic rights. So my view is that it is better for this to be resolved within the copyright ecosystem, but that fair use cannot do everything. 
And that in addition to every country that has fair use, Israel, the US, South Korea, Singapore was the first country um, from the Commonwealth <coughs> to adopt a fair use doctrine. Every country that has adopted it still has very explicit limitations and exceptions. So fair use is not a blanket. It's not a, you know, something you can wrap around and, and say this is the be all and all, and, and, and all of it. But it is important. And it is expensive to litigate. And so one of the reasons that you have it is you can create local practices that everyone starts to recognize as fair. So you don't even bother going to court. So you take away a lot of the ambiguity. So now in the US, lots of things don't go to court because everybody understands this is, uh, you're not going to win on this. Everybody knows this is fair use. And South Africa needs to create a culture where law professors, faculty across the universities, students all have an understanding of within the South African context, this is OK. Within the South African context, this is not OK. And you need courts to help you to do that. But if, if you don't have a copyright law that actually is focused on South Africa, then I would absolutely agree with you that fair use is not what you need. You need to have a law that does a lot more. Okay, great, thank you. We were fully planning to have a second round of questions, but time demands that we're moving on to the next item of the agenda, which is asking questions outside over snacks. <laughs> so please, uh, please join us outside and let us end with... Uh,